Hello and welcome to the next of our revision course lectures. We're going to have a little bit of a more detailed look at dividend policy in this lecture. So remember in our first session we talked about the interlinkage between investments, financing and dividend policy. So we should know now that all three of those things are equally as important and that all three of those things are linked together and that we can't have those successful investments without the financing and we can't have the financing unless we have an appropriate dividend policy. We need to decide do we pay out the dividend or do we reinvest it in the business or should we be raising capital in order to do those investments. So we're really thinking about dividend policy, but remember, this is interlinked with those other areas. It's all, they're all things that link together and should be considered as a whole. So what do we need to know about dividend policy when it comes to the exam? Well, we need to remember what investors like. So what do investors like to see from a business? Well, investors like to see a chart of dividends that looks like this. So going steadily upwards. Now this is sometimes referred to as a ratcheted dividend, i.e. it goes up every year. So it just goes up at a constant rate every year, up and up and up. Investors like it because they want to see something that gives them certainty. They want to know what they're going to get. What investors don't like is a fluctuating dividend, one that could go way up one year and way down the other. So the firm needs to consider that when they're setting their dividend policy, what investors like to actually see from the firm. Now, they do have some choices and there are various choices available to them. For example, a constant dividend. And if you think about how this would appear on the diagram, well, a constant dividend wouldn't be going up. It would just be a straight line across there. Now, that might suit some investors because they do have certainty, but don't forget that inflation will start to eat away at that dividend. So that's not something that the investors will particularly like, but it is something that the firm could consider. So a constant dividend gives certainty, but it isn't that ratcheted or increasing dividend. What about then an inflation-linked dividend? Well, Again, that would go up. So assuming that inflation was going up, well, then this dividend would go up with inflation. But don't forget, investors will want an investment that beats inflation, something that goes and surpasses inflation. So that, again, may be something that would cause a problem. It may be something that investors would not like. Well, what about a growing dividend then? So a growing dividend would seem to meet these criteria. We pay a growing dividend rather than linking it to inflation or a constant one. We simply increase our dividend year on year. Now, do be aware that you will need to have retained earnings to do this because what if the business made a loss one year and you're still increasing the dividend? Well, you can do that so long as you have reserves, so long as you have retained earnings to cover it. So sometimes businesses will do this regardless of what earnings they made in the year. Or it may be that they will pay a percentage of earnings. The problem with that being that that would fluctuate with earnings. And remember, investors don't like to see a fluctuating dividend. They like to see a growing dividend dividend constantly growing over the course of time. What about paying no dividend at all? Well, that is one that you should consider because when we come later on to look at the investments that should be undertaken by the firm, we're going to say that any investment that gives us a positive NPV should be undertaken by the firm. That's because that will increase shareholder wealth. So that's what we're all about. We already learned that in our first session. We want to increase shareholder wealth. Positive NPV increases shareholder wealth. So if we can reinvest our money in projects that are going to increase that shareholder wealth, well, then we should do it. We shouldn't be paying out a dividend.
So some businesses will reinvest that earnings right back into new projects that give a positive NPV. Apple in the US, for example, is a good example. They have reinvested their earnings back into the business to generate new products. Those products are successful. They generate positive NPVs and that leads to share price growth. So that's something that needs to be considered. The choices are varied and you may have to assess in an exam question what the current dividend policy is and perhaps suggest a better dividend policy or what they could do. And you could have a constant dividend, inflation linked, growing, linked to earnings or indeed no dividend or reduced dividend depending on what's happening with the business. So that's the things we need to be able to discuss. That's likely to come up in terms of assessing what a business is doing now and what they could do in the future. There also are some theories that you should be aware of and be able to discuss in the exam. And these are important. They come up a lot. The first one, probably the most important, is Miller and Medigliani's irrelevancy theory. I'm going to do a slide on that in the next uh, little bit. So we'll come to that shortly. The other ones you need to be aware of, signaling to the market. Well, that's exactly what we talked about at the start. What do investors want to see? And invariably, investors want to see an increased or ratcheted dividend going up over the course of time. So beating inflation, going up constantly, not fluctuating. Now, you might get away with reinvesting the earnings into new projects, if you're a very successful firm and you've proved that you can generate positive NPVs from that. Um, otherwise, the signaling to the market is important because they will want to see that ratcheted dividend. They might assume if you didn't pay a dividend that the business was in trouble. So you need to be careful with what signal your dividend sends to the market. Bird in the hand theory is that investors want their return now rather than waiting for it. So rather than the business reinvesting the earnings and depending on share price growth, the bird in the hand argument says that investors want that return now rather than waiting for it because they're taking a risk by allowing the, the return to be reinvested in the business. The investors are taking the risk that that won't be successful. So they'd rather just not take that risk, get their return now in the form of a dividend. The clientele effect is that you should stick to one policy. People who want that policy will gravitate to your firm. So investors that want a, a large dividend payment will go to firms that have a policy of paying out a large dividend. Investors that are more interested in capital growth will go to firms that are reinvesting their earnings into that capital growth. So the clientele effect says that as a business, you should choose one of those dividend policies and stick to it. Investors then know what they're going to get and can choose the business based on that dividend policy. Lastly, do look out for script dividends, which is dividends paid in shares, not cash. The examiner will just assume that you know what a script dividend is. So that is for businesses perhaps that have cash flow problems like startup businesses. So rather than paying out a dividend in the form of cash that they maybe don't have, they pay out a script dividend, which is to pay out shares instead of cash. So those are the core aspects that you may well be asked to discuss in the exam. Look for the choices that a, a business can make in terms of their dividend policy based on what they're currently doing and the information in the question. Then be prepared to regurgitate those theories. So Miller and Medigliani we're going to talk about now. Signaling to the market is what signal the investors will take from your dividend policy. Bird in the hand, investors wanting returns now rather than taking the risk of waiting until later. The clientele effect is that the business should choose a dividend policy and stick to it. And script dividends are paying out shares instead of cash. Now, what about this Miller and Medigliani's dividend irrelevancy theory? 
Well, we'll meet Miller and Medigliani again, but they were all about maximization of shareholder wealth. So remember we said that that was our share price growth plus our dividend paid. So both of those go into making up our shareholder wealth increase. Now, what Miller and Medigliani said was that the firm has a choice. They can either pay out a dividend to their investors or they can reinvest their earnings back into the business. Now, if they pay out a dividend, the investors will get a return in the form of a dividend. So that's part of our maximization of shareholder wealth, as we've mentioned. Or if they reinvest the earnings into a project, for example, that project should a earn a positive NPV and the share price should increase. So regardless of whether they pay the dividend or reinvest the earnings, the investor should get the return. They either get the return in the form of the dividend that's paid or they get the return in the form of a share price increase. Because if you invest in a positive NPV project, well then the share price will increase based upon that. So both of these maximize shareholder wealth, meaning that dividends are irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether they're paid or not. The investor gets their return either way. However, they did make certain assumptions that aren't necessarily true in the real world. For example, they assumed rational investors. Well, the financial crisis has proved that we definitely don't have those. Um, no transaction costs, a perfect capital market. Well, we know that that is not true in the real world. There are transaction costs in moving money between shares, for example. And they assume no tax difference between getting a dividend and getting share price increases for your shareholders. Well, there is a difference. If you get the return in the form of a dividend, you will be taxed under the income tax laws. Whereas if the share price increases, unless you sell the share, there's no capital gain. And even if you do sell it, capital gains are taxed in a different way. So it assumes all of those things. Now, this is important because it's tied in with Miller and Medigliani's capital structure theories, which we look at later. And they really focus on the financing aspect of the course. So this is tied in with that, that maximization of shareholder wealth, what a firm should do with its money, and indeed whether those dividends paid will affect the price, the share price of the firm, and will affect how the investors view their investment. So let's now see if we can look at a question based on this. So we're going to look at June 10, question four again. We've already done part A. We're going to look now at part C, which focuses in, first of all, on the linkage between investments, financing and dividends, and then gives you the opportunity to go ahead and discuss the dividend irrelevancy theory. So um, have a look at this question. See if you can make some notes as to what you would come up with in the answer and then see how I approach the answer in order to pick up the marks available. In June 10, question four, part C, we're asked to discuss the relationship between investment decisions, dividend decisions, and financing decisions in the context of financial management, illustrating your discussion with examples where appropriate. Now we're looking for eight marks here, so we want to split this down talk about the uh, relationship first of all for a few marks, then perhaps uh, investment decisions, dividend decisions and financing decisions and build it up in that way until we reach that eight marks that we're looking for. So the suggested way I think to answer this question is to start by getting that link between investments, financing and dividends. And we mentioned that that interlinkage is often referred to as a triangle. It's referred to as such because the company is unable to make investments without appropriate financing through debt, equity or retained earnings within the business. So we can't make those investments without the financing. Now in addition to that 
the financing will be dependent on the dividend policy because the dividend policy will affect the retained earnings in the business. In addition, the dividend can't be paid without successful investments. So you can choose to use retained earnings. If you don't, if you pay those retained earnings out in the form of a dividend, then in order to make the investments, you will have to raise finance. So you'll have to raise debt or equity. And as well as that, if we don't have the successful investments, well, then we won't make the profit. And that means we wouldn't be able to pay out the dividend that we uh, were required or wanted to do. Now, Miller and Medigliani suggested that the dividend policy of the firm is irrelevant. Now, they first of all said it was irrelevant to the share price of the firm, as it will be dependent on the success of its investments. It said the optimal use of funds was one that involved investing in all projects with a positive NPV and that would increase shareholder wealth. So we mentioned that that's what we should be doing in terms of our investments. We should invest in all projects with a positive NPV because that increases shareholder wealth, which is what we want to do as finance managers. The dividend policy of the firm was also irrelevant uh, to the shareholders because remember they will get their return either in the form of revenue if they receive the dividend or if it is reinvested in the business they should get capital growth in the share price. So um, if the dividends weren't paid out to the shareholders the share price would increase when we had a project with a positive NPV. In that case it's irrelevant whether the business pays out dividends or not. In addition then, Miller and Medigliani suggested that the capital structure of the firm was irrelevant to its value, as this was dependent on business risk rather than the financial risk of the firm. So this is something we're going to look at in more detail later on, the capital structure of the firm and whether that affects the value of the firm. So the business risk is the industry risk in which it operates, whereas the financial risk is the gearing or proportion of debt and equity in the firm. So that's a little bit about the financing side of this. Now, again, we'll come to that in a bit more detail later on. But Miller Medigliani suggested that the financing of the firm, i.e. the capital structure, was irrelevant also to the value of the firm. They said, regardless of what your capital structure was, how much debt or equity you had, it didn't matter. The value of the firm depends on the industry in which you operate, not how much debt or how much equity you had. So that's a little bit of discussion on the financing that we'll, we, we will come to in more detail later on once we've gone over weighted average cost of capital and so on. So that's how we would approach this question on the linkage between investments financing and dividend policy and hopefully that linkage will become even more clear as we refresh our memory and start to look at all of the different areas of the course as we move through it.